The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's nice to uh, hopefully I'll get to meet all of you afterwards. Um, my name is Aiden Schmidt. I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, understanding abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, to give you a little bit of background, you know, this is my opportunity to kind of introduce myself to all of you and the community. So I wanted to give you a little bit of my background, where I'm from. I'm originally from Long Island. Um, I went to Cornell for undergrad, and then I worked on Wall Street for several years afterwards. Um, kind of had a quarter life crisis and decided I wanted to be a physician. So um, I went back to school and I basically had to do college again to do, get a post back pre-med um, in order to get into medical school to take all the prerequisites. And then I attended um, Stony Brook University um, on Long Island for medical school. And then I completed my residency this past June at NYU Winthrop Hospital in Mineola. Um, and I moved here with my beautiful wife and two children in uh, July. And I love it down here so far. And thank you so much for having us. Um, I don't have any um, conflicts of interest or financial disclosures to provide during this lecture. So I just wanted to clear that up. Um, you know, to give you a more broad sense of you know, why I'm here, I just want to give you some facts to know about abnormal uterine bleeding and how we kind of evaluate it and um, things of that nature. So to really um, get an idea of what we're talking about, first we need to really define what uterine bleeding is. Um, once we can define uterine bleeding, um, we need to evaluate the bleeding. There are lots of different causes depending on um, where you are in your, in your life and um, what's going on medically. Um, so we need to determine what the cause is, and then of course, once we determine what the cause is, we can move on to treatments. And I provided that illustration of the uterus and ovaries, just to give you an idea, something to reference in your mind's eye, um, you know, depending on how familiar you are with anatomy, to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, and there will be more graphics um, to kind of illustrate um, things going forward. Um, so what is uterine bleeding? Um, uterine bleeding is, it sounds um, interesting to say it's any bleeding that originates from the uterus, but that's easier defined than, um, you know, once we do some investigation sometimes we find that uterine bleeding may not be actually coming from the uterus, so it would not be uterine bleeding. It, well, it, then it's not uterine bleeding. I'll go through, okay, I'll go more into, into depth and you, I'll kind of address that in uh, the next couple of slides. Um, but when people usually think of uterine bleeding, the first thing people usually think of is menses. And you know, you notice that either in your undergarments or uh, on a sanitary pad or in the toilet. Something I want to kind of educate you all on is that, you know, it can be very uh, disconcerting to a patient when she sees blood in the toilet. And it's important to know that when there is blood in the toilet, it can be very deceptive. So you can have one or two drops of blood in the water in the toilet, and it can look like a lot of blood. And it's very scary to a lot of people, and understandably so, I, can, I can't imagine. Um, but I just want to kind of give you an idea that just because you see a little blood in the toilet doesn't mean that you're hemorrhaging or anything like that. It could be very little blood that kind of just dropped into the toilet and spread in the water, and it looks like a lot more than it actually was to kind of reassure you if you see that sort of thing. Um, you know, there are two different approaches we take when we look into abnormal versus normal uterine bleeding. Obviously, menses is a normal physiological thing that occurs in women during reproductive ages. Um, but we kind of evaluate, and there are different causes for uterine bleeding depending where you are um, in your life, if you're still in reproductive age or if you're menopausal. Um, so I kind of gave an idea of what things we look at to uh, define abnormal uterine bleeding in those two different um, parts of your life there. And we'll go into that in more detail in a minute. So, as you so succinctly brought up, it's important to determine where the bleeding comes from. And um, I'll show you some illustrations on the next slide that really illustrate how 
difficult it can be to figure out where blood is coming from when you find it. Um, you know, there can be non-uterine sources. Now, though, if there was a non-uterine source, it wouldn't necessarily be uterine bleeding, but you could be evaluated for uterine bleeding because you're unsure of where the blood is coming from. So there are organ systems that are uh, around the GYN system that can cause bleeding and may present to a patient in a way that they would think they might have uterine bleeding, but in fact they are not. And they need to be evaluated by a physician in order to determine that. So some of those sources can be the urethra, the cervix, the vaginal walls, and or the rectum. So this is to kind of help illustrate um, how difficult it can be for a patient. And if you can still hear me, I'll just walk over. I don't have a pointer. Um, but you can see how close um, the orifices are of the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum here. So it, it, if there's blood coming from any of them, it can be very difficult to discern for a patient where the blood is actually coming from. And when we have blood coming from the urethra, I, I included a picture of the, um, the kidneys here to show you that the bleeding could come anywhere from the kidneys down through the ureter into the bladder. Here's the bladder here, and then out through the urethra. So anywhere along this track, if there's bleeding, you can see how close the urethra is to the vagina and make it very difficult for patients to tell where the bleeding is coming from. Um, so that's why being evaluated is so important because you may assume it's one thing and it could be something completely unrelated or different and need a different type of physician to evaluate and we can help you discern that type of thing. I put some things up there because just to give you an idea of some things that can cause bleeding in those different areas, you can have a kidney stone, of course bleeding, um, blood in your urine is never normal and should always be evaluated. Um, so. If you do notice blood in your urine, I want to tell you that you should be evaluated either by GYN or urologist, and we can help figure out what the cause is. It's not always uh, something very bad, but it, is, it needs to be evaluated to make sure it's not. And something that some people don't realize are that medications and diet can actually change the color of your urine. So it might actually not even be blood. It could just be a different color to your urine because of medications you've taken or... Um, uh, ch excuse me, <coughs> changes in your diet. And actually, interestingly, we will give patients when we do surgery some medications to change the color of the urine to help us uh, evaluate the, uh, the urethra and the bladder to look for defects and things like that. That's a whole other topic. Um, so, I kind of addressed the uh, urethra um, and the vaginal walls could obviously have bleeding that would come out the vagina, but that wouldn't be coming from the, the, uh, the uterus. Other things, you could have uh, bleeding from your rectum, which could be related to colonic polyps or anal fissures or hemorrhoids. You know, if you're uh, on the toilet and you happen to wipe and see blood on the toilet paper, you might not know where that blood is coming from. Um, and as I mentioned, there are medications that can change the color of your urine, but ble bleeding in any of these areas can be caused um, or related to, I shouldn't say cause, but more related to medications you may take for other medical conditions. Um, you know, if you have AFib and you're on anticoagulation or you have blood clots and you take bloods, people use the colloquial term blood thinners, they can make you more prone to bleeding in areas that you might not otherwise um, have bleeding normally. So taking those medications could cause bleeding that otherwise would not happen if you were not on those medications. So that could be the cause of um, or the exacerbation, exacerbation of the cause thereof. So, um, when we do have a patient come in, it's important to evaluate uh, the uterine bleeding, and the most important thing is the history and exam. Um, that can kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at, you know, how old a patient is, is it cyclical, could it just be related to their menses if they're still in reproductive age, um, if they're non-reproductive age, um, is it something else that we need to look into? Once we kind of go through the exam and we can, we do an exam with the speculum and determine that the bleeding is in fact coming from the uterus, um, we need to really um, determine the cause of that. And the first step, other than making sure that the patient is stable and that um, you know they're not uh, very anemic at the time, so we would do blood work for that, is we would do imaging to get a much better look at the reproductive organs. 
uterus and the adnexa. Adnexa meaning your ovaries and your fallopian tubes next to the uterus. A lot of people, when they think of imaging and medicine, they think of a CAT scan or MRI, but as gynecologists, we find that ultrasound is the best way for us to evaluate the GYN organs. So we usually start with that. Now, there can be reasons why we would do other imaging after that, um, but in general, we would start with an ultrasound and use that um, information to kind of move us forward in our evaluation. Um, the other thing, after we can um, do some imaging to get a look at the organs, is um, once we have determined what the, you know, when we're looking at an ultrasound, we can think, look at things like um, the thickness of the uh, endometrial stripe, um, that's the lining of the uterus, or if you have fibroids or things like that. Sometimes we need to take a tissue sample to determine um, what is the cause of the thickened endometrium or something like that. And, um, or if there's bleeding from the cervix, we would need to do something like a pap smear. So we like to do what's called tissue sampling or a biopsy, some people call it. Um, so a pap smear would be an, a way of evaluating um, tissue on the cervix, and if you were going to really take a biopsy, you would do what's called a colposcopy, and that's taking a little piece of tissue from the cervix. Um, if you wanted to evaluate the inside of the uterus, like the lining, you would have to do something, either an endometrial biopsy, which I'll go into more de uh, detail about that, or dilation and curatage, which is a more, I don't want to say invasive, but it's more of a surgical procedure, whereas an endometrial biopsy is more in the office. And if someone were to require surgery um, in the removal of um, the uterus, um, we will send uh, the uterus, once we remove it, to the pathologist in the middle of surgery for them to evaluate it for any uh, tissue abnormalities to see if there's any further surgery or evaluation that needs to be done during the surgery. So this is, uh, this is, uh, a way that every medical student and or OBGYN resident learns to kind of evaluate um, uterine bleeding. And it's, uh, people use the term palm coins. And it's just a way of thinking about the causes of bleeding. So you can have an endometrial polyp. You could have adenomyosis, which I'll explain um, in greater detail in a little bit. You could have a leiomyoma, which in, in um, common terms is a fibroid. Um, or you could have some type of cancer or malignancy. Now, it says malignancy and hyperplasia because this is a very long topic, so I won't go too, into too depth, but I just want to kind of lay something out to you guys because I think the word, term cancer is overused in society these days, and it applies to lots of different things where, in reality, there are all different diseases. And you need to kind of think of cancer as like a spectrum of disease. So if you have you start with completely normal and you end up with cancer. But a lot, there are lots of different steps along the way to get there. So hyperplasia would be the first step towards getting towards uterine cancer. That's when the endometrial lining is growing faster than it should be or it has abnormal cells, but it's not quite cancer yet. It's a bit of a spectrum. So we like to kind of catch things early before it gets to um, a point where someone has cancer. You can kind of think of the same way, like you get a pap smear to kind of evaluate cervical cells that are abnormal before it turns into cervical cancer. I just kind of wanted to lay that out for you. Um, other issues that um, could be causing um, the bleeding are coagulopathy, and that's a um, when a patient has an issue with um, bleeding for, they could have von Willebrand's factor or something like that, um, or they could have platelet issues. Um, so that's more, the bleeding is a function of the blood not um, clotting the way it should, as opposed to um, a more serious issue. Not that that's not serious, but I'm talking about in terms of the uterus. Um, you can have ovulatory dysfunction, and that usually occurs during um, childbearing um, ages. And I'll kind of discuss um, cursorily the, um, the a woman's cycle and how that can kind of cause some bleeding. And then you can have endometrial issues, which fibroid like we discussed, or overgrowing, um, things like that. And then iatrogenic, that's a fancy word for doctor caused. Now, iatrogenic could mean if someone's on birth control pills. And um, maybe you take, you know, there are different ways of prescribing birth control pills. You know, the classical way is you take them for a month, you take three weeks of, of pills with uh, 
hormones in it, and then you take a week of pills with no hormones in it, and then you have what's called a withdrawal bleed. That withdrawal bleed would be iatrogenic because we are giving you medication, and then we're stopping the medication even though you're still taking pills. They don't have any, any medication in them, and we're causing the bleeding by stopping that. You can take, horm you can take uh, contraceptive pills for months at a time and have no bleeding at all, and then you would not bleed until you stop taking the hormones. That also happens in hormone replacement therapy. Some people will take cyclic hormone replacement therapy. It's a very similar concept. You take hormones and then you stop taking the hormones and you'll have bleeding, um, which I'll kind of address in a little bit. Okay, so how do we distinguish menses or your period from abnormal uterine bleeding? So people had to come up with you know, when women are having normal bleeding, normal as in regular menses, how do we define what's normal and how do we define what's abnormal? So um, they kind of looked at population distributions and what the average person has in terms of frequency and regularity, and they came up with these uh, definitions and what is defined as normal menstruation. Anything that does not fit these definitions when you're um, in your reproductive age, that would be defined as abnormal uterine bleeding. It does not fit the frequency of 24 to 38 days, um, or it's regular in terms of your, the, the, the length of your menstrual cycle does not vary by more than seven days, or the duration, you don't bleed more than eight days, or you have a volume of bleeding more than, greater than 80 cc's. And then we can have bleeding in between cycles as well. So you can have normal menses and normal menses, and there can be spotting in between, which would be considered abnormal, but it might not be um, indicative of something bad happening. It just would be abnormal. So that's why I want to kind of, I'm going to keep trying to um, hammer home the point during this presentation that um, anything that is abnormal should be evaluated. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's something bad. It just means that we need to ter determine that it's not something bad before it could become something bad. So as I was dis discussing, this is what a normal um, menstrual cycle would look like. You know, it's a classical 28 days. You have your menses on day zero or one, and then you bleed for a few days. Now, changes in hormones and ovulation cause the, the thickness of the end. So this is a kind of a cross-sectional view of what the thickness of the endometrial lining would look like. So you're kind of looking like inside the uterus, and it kind of gets thicker and thicker as the uterus prepares for an egg coming down that may be fertilized and become, you become pregnant and to um, embed there. Once there's no egg here, changes in hormones um, or outgrowing the blood supply cause this extra tissue to kind of, we call it, call it sloughing off, or you have a menstruation, and that happens regularly. Now you need the, the, you can see those lines above it, those represent cyclical changes in hormones. Um, what can happen to some patients is you can have what's called anovulatory um, bleeding or ovulatory dysfunction where your hormones are thrown off for whatever reason. There could be lots of, you can have thyroid issues, you can have PCOS, there can be lots of things that could throw off um, your hormones. But as you can see here, the thickness of the lining is getting, it's, um, getting thicker, but it's not shedding in the normal sense. It's getting thicker, and when it should shed, because there are no changes in hormones, it keeps getting thicker. And what happens is, as this tissue gets thicker, it outgrows the blood supply coming, so a little bit comes off. So you don't have like what's called a classical um, bleeding. You'll just have spotting or a little bleeding, but you won't have a period, per se. And then the, the lining gets thicker and thicker and thicker, and sometimes you reach a point where it's so thick that you need surgical intervention to kind of remove that extra tissue. These sort of things happen normally in the extremes of childbearing age, either someone in their teens who's just starting to have their period and their hormones aren't really going in the cyclical pattern that they should be, or closer to, um, closer to menopause when um, the ovaries are starting to not make as much estrogen as they used to and they're not ovulating. So that's when you see these sort of things happen. So, I put up here, postmenopausal bleeding is almost never normal. Now, it's never normal, but it can be expected, and the one way it would be expected is when I was saying before, if you were taking hormone replacement therapy, um, and we were, you were taking it cyclically, meaning in a regular pattern, and then you were having withdrawal bleeding because you stopped taking the hormones. 
that's not normal, but it would be expected and not something that needs to be evaluated because we caused it because of the medication we're giving you. Otherwise, if once you're menopausal and you see any bleeding, that always needs to be evaluated. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's something bad, but we have to make sure that it's not cancer. And once cancer is ruled out, and it could be caused by lots of other issues that are not an emergency or need to be addressed, sometimes it can even just go away on its own, we as doctors obviously just need to make sure that nothing really bad is happening and then we can address things that are not that uh, urgent or may not even need addressing at all. But it's important to always have it evaluated to make sure. So I just kind of listed some possible causes there. Atrophy, so as you age your, your ovaries don't work as well and you don't make as much estrogen and the tissue can kind of, um, your vaginal tissue can kind of thin out and it makes it a lot easier for it to kind of break and bleed and then if you're on a medication like a like a blood thinner that can make things like that worse so it's not something that's bad but you have blood coming out that should not normally be there if we did an exam we could see it's just oh it's just a little piece of tissue that's inflamed or thinner than it should be um, and it's bleeding for no real reason so it's not something that needs to be addressed per se it could be but um, it's not something like emergency like uterine bleeding that would be a symptom of endometrial cancer but you can't know that until you get evaluated by a doctor. All you know is there's blood there. We need to kind of figure out where it's coming from. Because obviously, like I said, atrophy is not that, I don't want to say not that big a deal, but it's not in a, you know, something that's going to kill you. Whereas cancer or hyperplasia is something we need to address and make sure that we take care of before it's a real issue. You could also have polyps or fibroids, and these are at any age. Um, an infection. Um, can cause tissue to also become friable is the term we use, which is not similar to atrophy, but in concept, you know, the tissue kind of gets angry and it can bleed because it's got an infection. And if we, if we give you medication to clear up that infection, be it an STD or a bacterial vaginosis or something like that, the bleeding will stop because the tissue does, is not infected anymore. Um, and once again, you can take medications that can cause um, bleeding, like H HRT stands for hormone replacement therapy, AC stands for anticoagulation. If someone has a history of uh, breast cancer and then they're on tamoxifen, that can cause thickening of the uterus, and it's a well-known thing, but it does need to be evaluated if you have bleeding. Um, so like I put down on the bottom, and I'm going to keep saying this over and over because it's very important, um, it's important with any person with postmenopausal bleeding to be evaluated by a gynecologist can rule out all the bad things. Once those bad things are ruled out, we can address any you know, non-urgent issues. So once we go through our history, I kind of wanted to give you an idea of how we evaluate it. And you know, I was talking about ultrasound before um, and endometrial biopsy, um, just to give you an idea of what those things entail and what it looks like. So um, a vaginal ultrasound involves putting the probe into the vagina. You can kind of see it um, on the top picture. And it sends out sound waves. And since the probe is so close to the uterus, it can really get a good image of what's going on in the uterus. It can evaluate the thickness of the lining. It can tell you if there are fibroids. It can also look at the adnexa, the adnexa meaning the ovary and the fallopian tube on the side. Um, if we were to do an endometrial biopsy, this is an in-office procedure. It's similar from the patient's uh, standpoint to a um, pap smear. It's just a speculum exam. And we use a small little straw-like device to enter the cervix and to take a little piece of tissue to evaluate it for abnormal cells. It's a little more discomfort than a, than a pap smear. Um, usually it's okay if you just take Motrin and you get some cramping. And uh, Now some patients don't tolerate that or we have a much higher suspicion for um, cancer. Um, sometimes we might need to do a DNC, which is a more um, in-depth version of this, but that's in the OR and I'll show you pictures of that. And once again, you can have a pap smear, which this is the cervix right here. This takes a pap smear just as a little brush um, that kind of takes tissue right off of here to evaluate it for abnormal cells. So this is to give you an idea of um, things that we might find when we're doing these evaluations. So I tried to provide you um, picture of uterine fibroids. There are lots of different fibroids, as you can see, and they're all labeled there and what the types of fibroids are. You can have fibroids inside the uterus. You can have fibroids in the wall of the uterus. You can have fibroids kind of outside the uterus on the side that's more inside your abdomen. And 
Uh, fibroids are benign, but they can cause bleeding and they can cause discomfort. And um, some patients like to have them removed and or have a hysterectomy because the bleeding and dis discomfort is just too much for them to bear. Um, it's not um, an emergent issue because fibroids don't usually um, cause anything other than the bleeding and the um, discomfort, but it's a procedure that we can do to help patients have a better quality of life and things like that. Um, on the top left, that's a picture that illustrates what's called adenomyosis. Now, you have cells that line the uterus, and those are the cells that kind of get thicker when you menstruate and get ready for the, um, for the fertilized egg to um, implant. Sometimes those cells, we don't really know exactly how, but they can end up in the wall of the uterus. So this wall over here, and I'm just going to point to this picture because it's lower, but this is all muscle. And when you're pregnant and you have a baby, that's the muscles. These are the muscles that are contracting to push the baby out. And there's a lining here, which you can kind of illustrate here. There's a normal lining here, and then it gets thicker. Now, this is illustrating hyperplasia, which is not normal. But it just is giving you an idea of where I'm talking about, where the thickening happens. Well, some of these cells that may or may not be abnormal can sometimes end up in this mus muscular layer, as illustrated there. And they still respond to hormones as if they were in the uterus. So if you're still menstruating, they'll start bleeding inside the muscle, which can become painful. And as you can see, sometimes as they, you could have a full period, but then uh, these kind of pockets of abnormally placed tissue can start bleeding. So you'll have abnormal bleeding because it will not occur cyclically with your period, or it could be greater than it would be with your period, or it could be more painful, things like that. It, that, once again, is not in a medical emergency, but it can be very discomforting to some patients, and that's another reason sometimes we can do a hysterectomy. And finally, in the bottom left, I was just trying to illustrate to you how the lining, how it can be normal, and then it can get thicker, and then it's called hyperplasia, and if that hyperplasia um, has more abnormalities in it, um, sometimes that can develop into endometrial cancer. So that's kind of a forebearer to cancer and wh why we need to evaluate any uterine bleeding to make sure that is not what's occurring. Because these other issues are not um, life-threatening in and of themselves, though the bleeding associated with them can be, but obviously endometrial cancer can be life-threatening if it's not addressed early enough. So once we figure out what's causing the bleeding, what are our treatment options? So that, of course, all depends on the cause of the bleeding. Um, so there are non-surgical ways to address bleeding. Um, you know, even when you have some lower forms of hyperplasia, like I was discussing, we can put an IUD in, because some women can um, find they have very early hyperplasia and they still want to have children, so they don't want a hysterectomy because they still want to have a child. So you can put what's in, called an IUD, intrauterine device, um, into the uterus, and that has hormones in it to kind of stop the, the uh, abnormal cells from growing. That is not a permanent solution, it's a temporary solution um, to allow someone to have a baby and then you could do the hysterectomy afterwards because it still needs addressing. It's not fixing the issue, it's kind of halting the issue. And that's a very specific situation. Usually that's not how we address things, but I'm just trying to give you an idea of all the options. Um, you can also, um, if you have uh, anovulatory bleeding or ovulatory dysfunction, taking oral contraceptives, OCPs, is a medication that can help us regulate your cycle um, and cause the bleeding to be more regular and less severe. Um, or we can give you medication in a pattern that makes it so you actually never bleed. And you do not need to have a menses. That a lot of women come in when they're in childbearing age and they think that having their menses is something that has to happen. There's no physiological reason you have to have your menses if you're on contraceptive pills and or have an IUD in place. If you don't have your menses, there's nothing wrong with giving you medication to prevent it. Um, other medications could help with things for like atrophy. If you have atrophy, we can give you topical estrogen, which is like a cream you put in the vagina to kind of help the tissue kind of grow back to a little um, thicker so it will not bleed when it, when it uh, gets irritated. And then we have surgical intervention, which involve a DNC, which I'll have a picture of in a minute. And we can also um, do what's called a myoshore. I don't have an illustration of that, but that's like a, 
in theory, it's similar to a DNC, but um, it just uses a different instrument. And then we have ablation, and I'll, I'll illustrate that in a minute. And then that those are those are surgical procedures that can be formed and leaving the uterus in. So we kind of evaluate the tissue, and if we don't need to do anything else, the uterus stays in. Um, the next step up from that is if you had something like fibroids and they were bothering you and you still wanted to have children, so, well, first of all, some women with fibroids, the fibroids are in the way of them having children. So they need them removed in order to get pregnant and keep a pregnancy to term. That's not all fibroids, it's just some instances. Um, also, the fibroids could be just bothering the patient, so they want them removed, but they still want to have their uterus so they can have children, so we can do what's called a myomectomy, and that involves surgery where we kind of open up where all the fibroids are in the uterus, we remove the, the fibroids, and we sew the tissue back to kind of recreate a normal uterus without fibroids in it. And then the next and more definitive step would be a hysterectomy, and that's just removing the entire uterus, depending on the type of hysterectomy. Um, just to go give you know a more in-depth uh, discussion on the non-surgical evaluation, um, like I was saying, if a patient wants to maintain their fertility, um, and then postmenopausal, our big goal is rule out cancer. After that, we can evaluate and decide what we want to do um, from depending on what the cause is. And these are illustrations of the surgical intervention. So the picture on the top right is actually a hysteroscopy. And hysteroscopy is usually done in conjunction with the dilation and curatage. So this is done in the OR because the patient's very uncomfortable doing this, so we put them to sleep. And we use a speculum to allow us to visualize the cervix, and we can stick a tiny little camera into the uterus through the cervix to look around and see if we see any abnormalities. Once we've evaluated the inside of the uterus and we don't see anything abnormal, or we do, we take samples, and to take those samples, we would um, do what's called a curatage, and that involves kind of scraping very gently the inside. Um, just This is a, not a curatage, but I'm just showing you because the picture is low and I can reach it. Um, scraping this tissue here and here and here to kind of remove any excess tissue that might not be necessary and to bring tissue out so we can send it to a pathologist to evaluate it for any abnormalities. Now, um, this is illustrating what's called an ablation, and this is used usually in the end of um, reproductive life, where a patient may have an ovulatory or ovulatory dysfunction, and they have thickening of the endometrium. We have already determined that they do not have cancer, but they, are, they do not like the bleeding that is involved. So that is like a, um, it's very similar to the hysteroscope. It's an instrument that goes into the uterus, but it fans out and it uses radio frequency to kind of heat up the tissue, and it kind of burns the, just the, the very superficial layer of the inside of the uterus to prevent any um, bothersome bleeding going forward. We can't really do that if you want to be pregnant in the future or if you have cancer, so it's a very unique population of patients that get that, but it can be very helpful for them. And then um, this is just to illustrate um, what's involved in hysterectomy if we have to take the uterus out. Now this is illustrating a laparoscopic hysterectomy. Depending on the size of the uterus and the reason we're doing the surgery, it may be required that we would do what's called an open hysterectomy, which involves a larger incision, kind of like a C-section. Um, you know, if the uterus is very big or if a patient has cancer and it's not confined to just the uterus and the, the surgeon needs to evaluate other areas of the abdomen, we would need to do an open procedure. Um, but a laparoscopic procedure is, um, is much better tolerated by a patient because the incisions are very small and um, you can usually go home the next day or even that day depending on how involved the surgery was or how you feel um, and feel great. We also can do, some doctors do what's called a vaginal hysterectomy and that's removing the uterus all completely from below. So it would be, um, while these are all, you know, you need to disconnect the uterus from the blood supply and things like that, we're do, in the laparoscopic procedure, we're doing it from the sides, from above, through the abdomen. In a vaginal hysterectomy, we can actually access the uterus from the vagina and do remove the, the, the uterus uh, surgically from the vagina and take everything out of the vagina, and then we just sew it shut, and there are no incisions on the abdomen, and um, the patients tolerate that very well. It's a great procedure. It's kind of falling by the wayside. Uh, not a lot of surgeons do it these days because they're difficult and, not, and um, 
not for the patient, but they're, they're um, difficult for some, pay, from, for some surgeons to obtain enough training in them to, to feel comfortable doing them. Um, and we can also do myomectomies, like I was discussing, removing the um, fibroids, depending on the situation, either laparoscopically or open with a larger incision. So I know I've given you a lot of information. I hope it wasn't too much or too gruesome or anything like that. I was just trying to illustrate what we do and kind of educate you on what we do. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what the takeaway points that I really wanted you to um, take away from this talk. Um, the first one is do not ignore bleeding that seems abnormal. And that means any bleeding after menopause, do not ignore it. It might be something completely benign and something that does not need further intervention, but we need to determine that it's not something worse. Like I said, chances are it's something benign, but we have to make sure it's not. But the, and the other most important thing I want you to kind of understand and take away from this is we're here to help you, and we're here to walk you through all this. And while I give you this talk, I'm more than happy to see anybody that needs um, to be walked through this process, and we can, as physicians and gynecologists, we're more than happy to talk you through this and walk you through the steps and do the evaluation and tell you what's going on, and we're here to help. And I just want you to know that, and we're happy to answer any questions and help you guys with anything you may need. And I just wanted to thank you and show you pictures of my wife, beautiful wife and kids, and then I can take any questions you may have. No? Okay. Yes? Well, you can be. You may not be because um, depending on what your blood level is and how much you're bleeding and how often it's occurring and how long it's been happening. Um, so some women who have really bad fibroids, they bleed a lot and they bleed heavily and they've been doing it for years, they can come in very anemic and we have to give them blood transfusions. Um, and that, those are the types of patients that really need a hysterectomy to just, if they're not going to have any more children, to just remove the issue because the only way that issue is going to go away is by removing the source of the bleeding. Now that's not an emergency in terms of we need to take the, the uterus out the second, but it's an emergency in that you might need a blood transfusion because you're so anemic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, usually fibroids get smaller as you get older. Like, once you stop menstruating, they should, they stop, usually they stop bothering patients, but it can happen. So, I don't want to ever say never. It's more usually someone in their, towards the end of their reproductive life cycle that this is where it's usually an issue for them. But it can happen postmenopausally as well. Any other questions? Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.